Welcome to worship. Welcome to Second Ponce de Leon Baptist Church. On this Palm Sunday, the beginning of Holy Week, we are so glad that you're beginning this holy experience with us and hope that you'll stay involved throughout the week electronically as we go through this most unusual holy season together. We are still in an empty sanctuary, but by God's Spirit, we are still connected to one another. And I pray that in these unusual times, it'll be a most transforming uh, Holy Week experience for you. Things are changing every day, and we keep updating our website around the changes. Please check in at least daily to find out ways you can plug into educational resources or other worship opportunities. Also to stay updated about closings and openings and the like. I'm glad you're with us for this time of worship. Let's go to the Lord now in prayer. Oh God, we pray your grace with us during this time that even as we are separated from one another that we might find our unity in you and that from the sofa, from the coffee shop, we still might hear something of your transforming, life-giving word to us this time. So open us to your spirit and what you are trying to do within us during this most unusual season and make the promises of Holy Week come alive in a different way for us. We pray in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. Hi, boys and girls. It's so good to be with you again. I want to invite you to come a little closer to the screen, just like you would if you were here with me in the sanctuary for a children's sermon. Now, boys and girls, today is a really special Sunday. And to be honest with you, I'm really sad we're not all together here because today is Palm Sunday. And if you were here, we would come processing in, waving the palm branches to celebrate. I'm missing you today, but that doesn't take away from the fact that today is a very special day. You see, on this day, we remember when Jesus was coming into the city of Jerusalem. Everybody had been waiting such a long time for him to come, for the Messiah to come and set the people free. And Jesus was finally arriving. But he was doing something different and unexpected. He was coming into the city riding on a donkey. Everybody was so happy to greet Jesus that they went and they cut palms and they began to wave them and they began to shout and celebrate and say, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Everyone was so happy to see Jesus because they'd waited for him for so long. Well, you know, I bet today you and your family might want to celebrate Palm Sunday together, and you might not have palms at your house. So I've got a few other ideas for you. Some of you, when we gathered on Zoom last week, made paper palms with me. You can wave those around. Or if you don't have a paper palm this morning, you could grab some ribbon and wave it around to welcome Jesus. Or, you know what else you could do? You could go get some clothes out of your closet because in the story, some people even took their coats and waved them around, their clothes, and laid them down as Jesus passed to worship him. You see, even though we're not together today, we can still celebrate and welcome Jesus into our lives and into our hearts at our homes. So today, wherever you are, I want you to imagine that Jesus is passing down your street in your neighborhood on the donkey. And I want you to take a picture of you welcoming Jesus. 
with whatever you have into your heart and into your life because he loves you so much. Let's pray together, boys and girls. Dear God, we thank you that we have the privilege today to welcome Jesus. We're all at home today and we wish, Lord, that we were here, but we know that we can welcome you and celebrate you wherever we are. Help us as our families today to really enjoy praising Jesus together, just like they did on that first Palm Sunday. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. On this Palm Sunday, let's pray together. Blessed are you, holy God, for in Jesus Christ you came to rule in our lives, not as a king, but as a humble servant riding on a donkey. Enter into our hearts this day with your glory, that we may greet you with shouts of praise through Christ, our sovereign and savior. Jesus, during your ministry on earth, you showed your power and caring by healing people of all ages and stations of life from physical, mental, and spiritual ailments. Be present now to people who need your loving touch because of COVID-19. May they feel your power of healing through the care of doctors and nurses. Take away the fear, anxiety, and feelings of isolation from people receiving treatment or under quarantine. Give them a sense of purpose in pursuing health and protecting others from exposure to the disease. Protect their families and friends and bring peace to all who love them. O oh God, you remind us in your word not to be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present our request to you. And so we lovingly do just that. Trusting in your power and your grace, we ask for your protection, your blessing, and your comfort, and that perfect peace that can only come from your hand. This is our prayer that we ask in the name of your son, our savior, Jesus, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever, amen. What wondrous love is this, O oh my soul, O oh my soul? What wondrous love is this, O oh my soul? What wondrous love is this that calls the Lord of bliss to bear the dreadful curse for my soul, for my soul, to bear the dreadful curse for my soul. When I was sinking down, sinking down, sinking down, when I was sinking down, O oh my soul, when I was sinking down beneath God's righteous frown, Christ laid aside his crown for my soul, for my soul. Christ laid aside his crown for my soul. To God and to the Lamb I will sing, I will sing. To God and to the Lamb I will sing. To God and to the Lamb, who is the great I Am. Why millions join the theme, I will sing, I will sing. Why millions join the theme, I will sing. 
And when from death I'm free, I'll sing on, I'll sing on. And when from death I'm free, I'll sing on. And when from death I'm free, I'll sing and joyful be. And to eternity I'll sing on, I'll sing on. And to eternity I'll sing on. Our scripture this Palm Sunday is from Matthew's Gospel. I'll be reading from the 26th chapter, verses 14 through 27. Then one of the twelve, who was called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and said, What will you give me if I betray him to you? They paid him 30 pieces of silver. And from that moment he began to look for an opportunity to betray him. On the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying, where do you want us to go to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? He said, go into the city to a certain man, say to him, the teacher, say to him, the teacher says, my time is near. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. So the disciples did as Jesus directed them and they prepared the Passover meal. When it was evening, he took his place with the twelve, and while they were eating, he said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. And they became greatly distressed, began to say to one another, Surely not I, Lord. He answered, The one who has dipped his hand into the bowl will betray me. The Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that one by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that one not to have been born. Judas, who betrayed him, said, Surely not I, Rabbi. He replied, You have said so. While they were eating, Jesus took a loaf of bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, eat. This is my body. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. The artist Rubens has a famous painting of the Jewish warrior hero uh, Judas Maccabeus. In, in the painting, Judas stands calm with his chest out in the middle of this raging combat. All around in the painting, there are battle victims and heads on spears and death and dying and anguish. But right in the middle, there's Judas, all stoic and regal looking, glistening metal breastplate, long flowing red robe. The title of the painting is the triumph of Judas Maccabeus, and he does look triumphant and heroic. About 130 years before the birth of Jesus, this war hero led a revolt against the Seleucid Empire. The Greek Empire had taken over the Jewish temple. They defiled the temple with images for worshiping their Greek gods. So Judas led a historic revolt on behalf of the people of Israel. He organized guerrilla forces to overtake the slow and plodding Seleucid army. Then after the battle victory, Judas and the Maccabeans rode triumphantly into Jerusalem. It was like a parade, Judas out front on his war horse. The gathering crowd came and they put palm branches in the road and they shouted, Hosanna. And then Judas went into the temple and led the process to make that temple ritually clean again 
restoring the worship of Yahweh to the holy temple. And now every December, the Jewish community celebrates the festival of Hanukkah, commemorating the day that this Savior, this Messiah, overthrew the oppressive government and restored Israel. Now later, in, in the Jesus era, the Israelites are subjects again. This time it's not Greece, but Rome. The Jews are under Roman rule and they are hoping, praying for another Messiah, another Savior. Judas Maccabeus led a revolt more than a century ago, and now the people are waiting for a new Messiah, someone to liberate God's people and restore Israel one more time. And word has been spreading about a miracle worker from Galilee. He speaks as one with authority. He heals the sick. He restores sight to the blind. Even the wind obeys his command. They're whispering and hoping that this might be the one. So at the festival of the Passover, when the Jews from all over the region have come to Jerusalem and recreated that kind of uh, festival feel in the streets, all the buzz in the streets is that this new warrior hero might be in their midst. Folks were looking in the crowded streets, hoping to get some sighting of the one people were saying could be the new Messiah. And in this festival-like atmosphere, they recreated the triumphal entry of Judas Maccabeus. They put palm branches out on the road. They shouted, Hosanna. They waited for the Savior to ride in. They were waiting for this Savior who would come with a great display of might and regal glory. And Jesus turns the corner and galop, galop, he's riding a donkey. Sometimes, sometimes Jesus does not meet our expectations. It is sometimes really disturbing when Jesus does not conform to our image of how we think Jesus ought to behave. I've observed three different responses to people that people make when Jesus doesn't meet their expectations. Some people, some people just give up on Jesus altogether because the idea of who Jesus must be for them was greater than who Jesus actually is. So if Jesus doesn't conform to my ideas, then he must not be the Savior. I'll just give up. This happens to a lot of people during college. The rigorous academic study doesn't conform to the Jesus of Sunday school. So the 19-year-old just tosses the Jesus of Sunday school and says that she's enlightened. The second response that I've experienced when people, when Jesus doesn't meet expectations, is some people just remain so rigid in their ideology that they make Jesus conform, at least for them. They just distort and twist Jesus until he fits their notion of how Jesus ought to behave. You've heard me before Quote Anne Lamott saying, you can be sure you have created God in your own image if it turns out that God hates all the same people you do. That's a way of making Jesus fit your expectations. But the most mature response is to grow in understanding of the Christ who will not be defined by us. No doubt, some people in the streets of Jerusalem saw Jesus turn the corner. He's on the back of a donkey. He was not what they expected. And they said, I told you that wasn't going to be the Messiah. And they went on to something else. 
And I'm sure there were probably some others who just made it fit their narrative. They probably said, boy, that must be some mean warrior donkey that guy's riding. I bet he's a killer. But some embraced the mystery and asked, what kind of Messiah comes with no sword and doesn't ride a war stallion? And how, how will he defeat evil if not by violence? If Jesus does not meet my expectations, then how do my expectations need to change. Craig McMahon is the university minister at Mercer University. Craig is one of those, he's one of those guys that, you know, he's exceptionally healthy and fit. He's whip smart. He's an exceptional preacher. If he were not such a really nice guy, he would be really easy to hate. But last year at the trustee meeting at Mercer, he told this wonderful story uh, during a devotional. Craig was out running in his neighborhood. Of course, he would be out running in his neighborhood. But he said he's not usually a garbage voyeur, but he couldn't help but to notice that there was a box of trash on the curb during his run, and he slowed down and looked, and there was an old lamp that there was an old sewing machine, but in the middle of all this debris was a picture of Jesus. That's what caught him. He said it was the one that so many of us are familiar with, the brown-toned picture that Craig said makes Jesus look like a California Caucasian surfer dude, but it was disturbing. Why would somebody throw Jesus away? Was there disillusionment? Did Jesus not meet somebody's expectations? Whatever the decision, Jesus was about to be head, hauled off to the landfill. Craig's gut reaction was just like mine when I heard him telling the story. Something just pinched. Something, there's just something not right about that. Jesus in the trash bin. But the more he thought about it, the more he realized that they were not necessarily throwing away Jesus, just an image of him. Now that the image no longer fit, maybe it was not a shame at all. And now I'm quoting from Dr. McMahon's devotional. Maybe it was actually something very brave and honest and even good. Isn't it how we grow up? We have an image of how things are, and then life and learning shows us the flaws, the gaps, the inaccuracies of the image. So we take it down and replace it with something more true to life. I don't know what this troubling pandemic is doing to your faith to your image of God. You may be one of the ones who's really getting pinched in this crisis, experiencing a health crisis or a financial crisis because of this virus. It also might be challenging your current image of Jesus. You might be one of the ones trying to figure out right now in all of this, what do we do with Jesus when he doesn't meet our expectations? Well, as I mentioned, we really have three choices. You can abandon the faith altogether because Jesus didn't meet your hopes. Or make Jesus contort into the current understanding or we can grow in faith. Dr. McMahon said, this is how we grow up. We do not make Jesus conform to our image. We take down old images and replace with something more true to life. The Israelites had an image of who the Messiah must be. 
The Messiah must be a brawny warrior who holds a sword and defeats the enemy with violence. But the Messiah was even more than they could have hoped, even better than their image. The Messiah rode a donkey and defeats the enemy with love. The disciples had to change their image as well. You remember there was a time when they were arguing with one another about who would sit on the right hand, who would sit on the left hand of Jesus. When Jesus comes into power, I want to be there. I want to get my piece of the power. They had an image of who the Messiah must be too. And on the night before the crucifixion, Jesus gathered with them in an upper room. And he upended their expectations too. Jesus announces that one of them will betray him. He declares that the end is near. And then he takes a loaf of bread and pronounces that it's his body broken. He lifts a cup and invites them to drink the cup of suffering. This is not what Messiah was supposed to look like. And Jesus, once again, is not meeting expectations. But if we have the faith to not abandon Jesus when he does not meet our expectations, and if we have the resolve to not have Jesus conform to our image, if instead we have the courage to discard the old images in favor of a more mature, more lifelike version of Christ, we might actually be surprised at how small our original image was in the first place. You see, the best Israel could hope for was a warrior who would save the Israelites from Roman rule by violence. What they got was a Savior who would save all people from any oppression by love. If we meet Jesus on his terms and not our terms, we too might be surprised by the size of his salvation. So when the disciples came to the upper room that week and saw Jesus, he wasn't polishing a sword. He was sitting at a table. And the scripture tells us that he took the bread there with his disciples. And after giving thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then in like manner, he took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. As often as you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. And then the next day, surprising everybody, upending every expectation, he went to a cross to show that love is the most powerful force in the universe and modeled for us what love looks like. We're gathered in homes, I'm here. We all have our elements in front of us. Let's partake together of the elements. This is the bread of life. This is the cup of salvation. Let us pray. O oh God, open wide our sails 
to your spirit that we might not define you in our lives but let your love increasingly grow and define us. Surprise us. Give us something unexpected. Show us new ways that your love is bigger than we even imagined when we came. And break our bodies for the sake of that love that we might be agents of healing, ambassadors of your grace. In the name of Christ, amen. I'm glad you were with us in worship this time together. We'll be back together next week electronically. It'll be Easter Sunday. Keep in mind the website to see how we will be doing Easter next week. But however we do it, wherever we are, we'll celebrate the risen Christ. Go now with the reminder that Jesus does not conform to our expectations. Go in the confidence that his love is bigger than we even thought. Go in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hello and welcome to the All Together service. We are... Um, excited and honored to be with you today. Um, before we get into worship, though, we'd like to take a moment just to read a piece of scripture. Um, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, uh, verses 8 through 9, it says, We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. So as we think on that scripture during worship, let's just praise the Lord who provides and protects. We just thank you for calming the raging seas, for keeping us safe. We thank you that we can run to you and find safety. So we call upon your name even now, because at your name, everything must bow at your name we find safety in your name. Peace, bring it all to peace. The storm surrounding me, let it break. At your name, still, you call the seas to still. Rage in me to stay every way at your name, Jesus, Jesus. You make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus. You silence me, Jesus, Jesus. You make the darkness tremble, Jesus. Jesus, yeah. Oh, breathe. Call these bones to live. Call these lungs to sing once again. I will praise, oh, Jesus, Jesus. You make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus. You silence me, oh, Jesus, Jesus. You make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus. We call you Jesus, Jesus. You make the darkness tremble. Silence me, oh Jesus, Jesus. You make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus. And your name 
Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, we just thank you right now for you being Jesus. Thank you so much for dying on the cross for our sins. Jesus, we cry out right now. As the seasoned saints will say, there is something about that name. Heaven and earth will pass away, but Jesus, 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 God, we thank you, we love you, we praise you. In Christ's name we do pray, amen. Friends, I don't know about you, I don't know in what part of this earth you may be in, but that was some good singing right there. And to our musicians, to Jessica and to Isaac, oh my God, thank y'all and bless you all. Friends, today I want us to consider going to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 8 through 11. The New King James Version reads as such, We are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. Friends, today I want to encourage you with this simple topic, because he lives, I can face today and tomorrow. Because he leaves, lives, excuse me, I can face today and tomorrow. Friends, it was Bill and Gloria Gaither who wrote the song, Because He Lives. The lyrics of this timeless chorus says, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know who holds the future and life is worth the living just because he lives. Friends, this song was written at quite the chaotic time. My friends, paint the picture for you. It was 1971. There were threats of war. There were betrayals of national and personal trust and a lot of downright social upheaval. This song is quite nice, but as I forward, fast forward and stop at the section of our lives called today, I see a great deal of social upheaval going on as well. I see the threats of wars. I see racism rising. I see police brutality happening. I see the coronavirus touching people's lives in negative ways. I even know that we are quarantined at this moment. I understand before the coronavirus that women were still not always valued in society. And yet 
as Christians, if we look directly into everything that's going on in our life, it is a whole lot going on. But how many of you know personally that the best stories, the best products, and the best moments are produced in the midst of turbulent times? Friends, it's when you're tired that God gives you strength. It's when you're weak that God makes you strong. It's when you lose hope that God gives hope. It's when you doubt that God delivers. It's when you think things won't turn out in your favor that God blocks the last blow to your life, reverses the situation, and causes an uh-oh moment to be unconditionally great. Friends, we have hope, and don't you ever forget it. But if I look right now into 2 Corinthians, you got to understand today that the Corinth was the place, it was a great commercial center at the time of this text. It connected people to the world. But due to everything being at the fingertips of these people, they also had various beliefs that they had access to as well, other than belief in Jesus. There were many things that these people could worship. However, my good brother and friend Paul in the text. He's writing to the church at Corinth to clarify and to remind them to keep Jesus in the center of it all. Paul is telling them in 1 Corinthians very succinctly this, just stop the foolishness believers and just be faithful. But these good believers, they didn't want to listen. And so Paul decided to go to the church to share his sentiments. These people at the moment are attempting to test the validity of the messages that they've heard from Paul. They're attempting to test the validity of his office. And so yet Paul clarifies to them who he is and why he has come. But yet he has to abruptly leave to continue spreading the word of God. He can't even handle all of the business that he wants to handle. So what does Paul do? He writes a love letter to these believers and lets Titus deliver it. But yet he continues this story in 2 Corinthians, what we will be today. Because these same people have accused Paul of being dishonest. They've accused him of being unqualified. And here's the truth. They've accused him of being prideful. Mm -hmm. And just like we don't like rumors or false things said about us, Paul does not like that at all. And so Paul writes this clarifying message to these believers to defend his calling, his character, and his conduct. You see, this second letter is relevant to all of us because Paul at this moment is being persecuted, yet he continues to be faithful to God. Friends, right now in the midst of this quarantine, yes, it's uncertain. Yes, we don't know what to do, but yes, we should still be faithful to God. And so, my friends, I've come out of my house this morning just to simply encourage you a bit because I want you to know that there is hope to face the problems of today and the problems of tomorrow. Why? Here's the hope because the text teaches us in verses 1 through 2 that we have hope because God has equipped us with mercy. Look at the text. The text says, therefore, since we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we do not lose heart, but we have renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. My brother Paul tells these believers, I have not lied to you. Everything I said to you was truthful. I taught the church at Corinth the ways of God. I taught them the love of God through Christ Jesus. But yet he communicates this theological term that we love to use called mercy. You see, mercy is the compassion or forgiveness shown to others. Paul, you see, was the poster child for mercy. If you don't believe me, you flip on over to 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 13 through 14, and you're going to get the E. Hollywood true story of Paul's life. Paul, he chronicles and says, although I was formerly a blasphemer, a, per a persecutor, and an insolent man, but I obtained, here it is, mercy, because I did it, it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love, which are in Christ Jesus.'" 
Many of you may look at Paul's life in that snapshot and say, "Woo, I'm glad I'm not him, but I want you to know that Paul is not the only attendee at the mercy party. We have all had invitations to this party as well. The Bible declares in Paul's words in Romans 8 that we all fall short of the glory of God. You see, and we have experienced God's mercy, his compassion, his forgiveness, and because he has equipped us to have his mercy, we have have hope. Friends, we've been equipped with his mercy, but the text continues by teaching us in verses three through four, you're not hopeless. Why? Because he has also equipped us with the light of Christ. Listen to Paul's words. He says, but even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. My friends, when I read verses three through four, it makes me hit the rewind button to think back to when I was about seven or eight years old. I was supposed to always be getting ready to go to school. However, I would sit on the edge of my bed, turn to channel 17, which was TBS, and I'd watch my favorite cartoon, Captain Planet. I loved Captain Planet, but, but the premise behind this show was that each of the planeteers had a specific power that they used in conjunction to save the world. But what I loved was Captain Planet, this gray looking man with green hair would always say at the beginning of the show, that at the end, that after these planeteers had come together to save the world, he would now say the choice is yours. Paul right here is telling these believers in the text that the choice is yours. He's asking these believers, will you choose the skepticism of society or will you believe in the light of Christ? He, you see, Captain Planet told the viewers, all of us, that the choice was ours, but yet Paul and God through Jesus Christ is asking us the same thing. Will you follow the light of Christ? That he's equipped all of us with or will you follow the darkness and the skepticism of the world? The choice is yours, light or darkness, you choose. Friends, there may be some of you that may say, well, you know, I'm kind of skeptical about this whole Jesus thing. I, I really don't understand it. Well, I just want to tell you just like this. Think about the sun for a moment. The sun does not cease to be the sun, although the blind cannot see it. Neither will God cease to be God just because others don't believe in God. Friends, every day inside the church or outside the church, I am telling you, we need to be the church. We are the church by simply shining. This is the backdrop of what is meant by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, when he said in Matthew 5, verse 16, you let your light so shine that others may see your good works and glorify your father that is in heaven. Paul's telling these believers as well as us today, here's the simple thing, keep shining. Don't let anybody dim your light because there is hope. Why? Because we've received the light of Christ. Why? Because we've received God's mercy. But here's the truth. There's more hopeful, hopeful sentiments in this text. It teaches us in verses five through seven that we have also been equipped with his story to tell. Listen to Paul's words in verses five through seven. The text says, for we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your bond servants for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. Friends, what's going on at the time of this text is that the Greeks at this time believed that the message of the cross was foolish. The Jews at this time believed that the message of the cross was scandalous. And Paul urged these believers to not get caught up in these varied beliefs. But he's telling them, I need you to have faith in God. Paul's dispelling this whole myth that he's stuck up, that he's prideful or that he is sedity. You see, Paul says, I'm not like that. That's the wrong one. That's not me. Paul says, every single thing that I've done has been because the Lord has given me strength. It's been because I have leaned on the Lord and not my ability, but also because I've been entrusted with the gospel. You know the gospel. 
The gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And this is what Paul describes when he says, and we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not us. But God replaced not only a story that we did not have. He equipped us with the gospel, but here's the truth. God has also equipped us with a testimony. You see, we have this treasure, this good thing, his story that transcends time and space, his story that transcends borders and the cosmos, his stories that can break generational curses, his story that convicts hearts and regulates minds, his stories who mends families back together, who teaches humanity how to love and it teaches us all how to love. But friends, I want you to know that yes, that's the gospel, but you have a testimony, a testimony of how God has worked inside of your life, how God has moved and how God has helped you in danger seen and unseen. And my friends, just like you should spread the gospel, you should also spread your story, not to build your kingdom, but to glorify your father, which is in heaven. Friends, I want you to know that in the midst of social upheaval, you still have a story to tell. You have the gospel, but you also have your testimony. Friends, there is hope we can make it today and tomorrow because we've been equipped with mercy. Friends, we can make it today and tomorrow because we've been equipped with a story to tell. We can make it today and tomorrow because we have been equipped with the light of Christ. But here's the good truth that ought to make your peacock proud and hippopotamus happy. You can get excited because he has equipped us with divine resilience. <laughs> Friends, if we're going to start off, we're going to end just like we started right there in verses 8 through 11. The text says, we are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed, always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. Friends, <laughs> divine resilience, you see, when you think about that word resilience, it means to withstand or to recover quickly from difficulties, which ultimately means that you bend, but you don't break. It means that you fall, but you don't shatter. It means that you may fall down, but you definitely will get back up again. This is what Paul meant in verses 8 through 11 when Paul describes metaphorically and rhetorically some of the hardships that he has gone through. Paul, you need to look at this because in the text, the text here would preach itself because Paul, every single time that he talks about a hopeless thing and a hopeless problem happening in his life, he always ends in hope. <laughs> Look what he says. He says, I'm perplexed. Oh yeah, but I'm not in despair. <laughs> he says, I'm persecuted, but don't forget I'm not forsaken. He says, I've been struck down. Oh yeah, but I am not destroyed. And through every form of difficulty, this man ends in hope. You want to know why? Because he believes in Jesus. <laughs> and that same Jesus that died on the cross for each and every one of our sins, this same Jesus that loved us so much to come down 42 generations to die for sinners like you and I, this same God that raised him from the dead, we have this type of power at work in us. We have this type of power when we accept Jesus as our savior. We have divine resilience. My friends, I want you to know that I cry just like you. My heart breaks to see people at this moment dying because of the coronavirus. My heart breaks to even witness some of our seniors not be able to possibly not graduate, but I want you to know we have divine resilience. I want you to know that the light of Christ is still in our own position. I want you to know that we still have his mercy. And when we know this, we can live today and we can live tomorrow. It's because Jesus lives that we can face today and tomorrow. It's because he lives that we're free from harm. This I know who holds our future and life is worth the living just because he lives. Friends, our together takeaway is simply this, that Jesus equips us with divine resilience when our faith outweighs our fear. Friends, I wanna know right now, is there any of you that are watching 
who need this Jesus inside of their hearts. If that's you that you say, man, I really need to know Jesus, I invite you today to accept this Jesus into your heart. You can do it from wherever your location may be. Just simply repeat this prayer after me. I admit that I'm a sinner in need of God's love. I believe that Jesus died for every sin that I would or could commit. And I confess that Jesus is the Lord and the head of my life. Friends, we were made to be in community and perhaps you feel God prompting and leading you to bend your life into what's happening here at Second Ponce. I let you know right now we are an imperfect group of people that serve a perfect God. But if that's you, or even if you've accepted Jesus today, you feel free to email us at spdl.org or you feel free to just drop a sentence or two in the comment section and one of our staff members will get in touch with you. But friends, even if you need prayer, we want to pray with you. I know that life is real uncertain and we don't know it's a lot of shutdowns happening, but I want you to know we serve a risen Savior. I want you to know that this is not a performance, this is our worship. And we pray right now that you know you have hope. God, thank you for being with us. Thank you for helping us worship together. God, we love you. We magnify your name. Help us to know that even in our perplexing states and times of uncertainty, we have hope. In Christ's name we do pray, amen. Thank you for worshiping with us. We hope to see you again.